we deal with on a daily basis. Um, a little bit about the museum. Uh, it is located in the Batavia office of the Holland Land Company in the building that was built in 1815. Uh, and it was from that building that essentially all of the land of Western New York was sold from to settlers and others uh, as they came into the area. Um, so what I'll be talking about is going through sort of the history of the land company and of land transactions in Western New York and just the, uh, the overall impact uh, that we still see today from uh, the Holland Land Company. So let me just get my uh, PowerPoint up for us here. So to start off, though, uh, we're not even really going to uh, start off with the Holland Land Company as there was uh, several bits of information that uh, predate it that I feel are important to talk about as they sort of set the stage. So the first thing we'll talk about is actually the Treaty of Hartford, which uh, actually occurred all the way back in 1786. Now, the Treaty of Hartford was actually signed between New York and Massachusetts uh, in order to settle who had dominion over the western half of what we know as New York State today. Because uh, up until that point, uh, both states' colonial charters actually gave them the rights to the land. So something had to be settled in order to allow this to go forward. Uh, so what happened was that uh, Massachusetts got the preemption rights to sell the land and then also to extinguish the claims of any Native Americans in the area and then any settlers in the area would become New York State citizens. Uh, so it was actually a pretty simple uh, compromise and actually was very beneficial for both as Massachusetts was heavily in debt from the Revolutionary War and needed the money and New York made a lot of promises to people about giving land for service during the war and didn't have it to give until this happened. So uh, it was uh, a treaty that actually worked out for both equally. Now, the preemption line, and you'll see it on uh, the map that I'm showing here, uh, ran from about Sodus Bay uh, all the way down to the PA border. So it's at the 82nd milestone uh, on the 77th degree of longitude, and it actually is in present day Shemung, New York. Um, however, when they ran the, the line initially, it actually started to veer. Um, started to veer so they, and they ended up going around Seneca Lake when it was supposed to go through it. So they, it actually was off by a little bit, but that was eventually uh, fixed. So now Massachusetts has the rights to sell what equated to 6 million acres worth of land. And they needed to find a buyer. And eventually they found uh, that in the Phelps Gorham Corporation and the sale was made on April 1st, 1788. Uh, so the Phelps Gorham Corporation was run by Oliver Phelps and Nathaniel Gorham, and they paid $1 million paid in three equal annual installments to the rights to sell that land. Now they paid $5,000 to the Seneca nations to extinguish their rights to the Eastern portion of, which was two million, two and a quarter million acres, uh, which basically ran from around Rochester, uh, slightly farther west of Rochester, all the way to the preemption line in SOTUS. Uh, however, their, uh, their sale of land was kind of, was very rocky. Uh, they set up uh, land offices in Connecticut and Canandaigua, uh, making Canandaigua one of the very first real settlements in the area. And that's where their land office was. Uh, however, they only made one of their three annual payments and actually the faulted on the second. So on March 10th, 1791, the three and three quarter million acres west of the Genesee River actually reverted back to the state of Massachusetts. So we've already gone through one buyer in the area. Now we're going to have to see if we can find another. Now Massachusetts was able to find another buyer relatively quickly. And sorry, I missed uh, showing you what the Phelps Gorham purchase actually looked like there. Uh, those are uh, two uh, maps, one colorized, one not, and give you the idea of what the uh, eastern portion of the purchase actually looked like. And there's Mr. Phelps and Mr. Gorham for you. 
But now we'll move on to our second buyer, who was Robert Morris. Uh, now, Robert Morris was, at the time, the, pretty much the wealthiest man in the country. And it was his funds that actually basically paid for the American Revolution and paid for the Revolutionary Army, um, even though he was not necessarily a um, patriot right away. But uh, uh, he eventually joined the cause and became one of its most ardent supporters. But uh, Morris uh, became extremely interested in land speculation uh, as the United States became uh, a new country. And one of the areas that he looked at to fondly was the area of Western New York. Now, Phelps and Gorham sold off the remaining lands uh, that they still owned to Robert Morris for between 11 and 12 cents an acre. So multiply that by two and a quarter million and that gives you his first, per uh, how much he uh, spent on the first purchase. Uh, but he sold this right away to uh, um, speculators led by Sir William Johnstone Pulteney. And uh, this became known as the Pulteney Estate. And he sold that for $330,000. And this was most of Ontario, Steuben and Yates counties, along with parts of Allegheny, Livingston, Monroe, uh, Shiler and Wayne counties. Uh, however, this left the western portion that he had to deal with and he purchased it from the state of Massachusetts. Yeah. And this occurred in 1791. Uh, however, it, he only owned it for about a year as he looked to flip it as quickly as possible. And what he who he would find would actually be a consortium of bankers from Holland, later known as the Holland Land Company. So he would sell three and a quarter million acres uh, worth of land, which is the far left part, to the Holland Land Company and would keep the middle 500,000 acres to himself, which was the Morris Reserve. And this stretch was 12, 12 miles wide from the PA border to Lake Ontario. Um, and this was basically he held on to uh, as sort of an insurance policy and to maybe gain some later funds uh, from the land speculation as the area started to grow. Um, however, um, by the turn of the 19th century, Morris actually became heavily in debt and was actually imprisoned uh, for his outstanding debts, which forced Congress to pass its first bank bankruptcy legislation in order to save um, And it actually got Morris out of prison. Now, Morris would soon die afterwards, but uh, his name lives on in the Holland Purchase. And you'll often see it called the Morris Purchase as his purchase was uh, previous. And uh, to this day, Robert Morris's name still actually shows up here in Batavia. Uh, we have an elementary school, a uh, former elementary school that was named after him, but you'll still see his name pop up. Mount Morris is named after him and his family. So uh, it would be remiss if we didn't mention Robert Morris in, in any of the transactions. Now, before Morris could uh, finish the sale to the Holland Company, uh, it was necessary that they had to extinguish the rights of the Senecas, uh, their preemptive rights to the land. And this would happen in the Treaty of Big Tree. Now, the Treaty of Big Tree was hosted uh, just outside of Geneseo uh, in, uh, beginning in August 1797. And it's called the Treaty of Big Tree because uh, on the land, uh, there was a giant oak tree uh, that was renowned and I actually have a picture of it for you there. Um, it was about 70 feet tall and about 24 feet at its base. So it was a massive tree. Um, and uh, it began there because uh, it was very near the home of William Wadsworth, who was one of the early pioneers in the area and was the captain of the local militia. And if you know Geneseo at all, you know the, term, the name Wadsworth. Um, it goes all the way back to this. Um, so all of the major Seneca chiefs uh, congregated in the area. I have Red Jacket pictured there, but you also had Corn Planter, Mary Jemison, white woman of the Genesee was there. Um, Colonel Jeremiah Wadsworth, uh, William's son was the treaty commissioner. Uh, he was assigned it by uh, President George Washington. You had Thomas Morris, who was representing his father Robert's interests. And then 
representing the Holland Land Company, you had Theophilus Casanova, Paulo Busti, and Joseph Ellicott, who had just been hired as the chief surveyor of the area. Now, negotiations did not go smoothly and took quite a while. Uh, Red Jacket was in opposition to the treaty from the start and did his best to try to convince the other chiefs that this was not a good idea in order to sign the treaty. Uh, however, uh, pressure soon uh, overwhelmed him and he saw the writing on the wall and eventually was signed. Now, the latter part of the negotiations, you could say, uh, were under some different pretenses as Morris's camp bought uh, several cases of whiskey in and used it to bribe and uh, coalesce the uh, uh, native population, uh, native chiefs there in order to sign it uh, and get the deal done a lot quicker. Um, so eventually the treaty is signed on September 16th, 1797. Uh, and in it, the Senecas uh, sell the rights uh, of that three and a quarter million acres to the Holland Land Company uh, for $100,000 in bonds and are then allowed to retain 200,000 of the, those acres on 10 reservations. Uh, those reservations would be the Canawagus, which is near Avon today, Big Tree, which was where the treaty was signed outside of Geneseo, Little Beards Town, which is uh, near Kylerville, Squawky Hill, which is near Leicester, Gardo, which is near Mount Morris, Canadia, which is near Houghton today. Then you had the Cataraugus, which is where Salamanca is, or sorry, Cataraugus is where Silver Creek and Irving is uh, along the border between Chautauqua, Cataraugus, and Erie counties. Uh, Allegheny, which is where Salamanca is, Buffalo Creek, which would be South Buffalo, West Seneca area today, and the Tonawanda, which is uh, uh, right in the border there of Orleans, Erie, Niagara, Genesee County, uh, right down the road from us here at the Holland Land Office Museum. So in total, 10 uh, reservations were set up. Um, and today you can see maybe three of those with any real uh, still established borders, but uh, this is where they all uh, start from. So with the signing of the uh, Big Tree Treaty, the Holland Land Company can now move in and do uh, its its job in order to get the land ready for settlers to move in and buy the land. Um, so the first general agent, as they were called, for the land company was Theophilus Casanova, who's on uh, your left there. He was the one who actually got uh, interacted with Morris and was the one who set up the purchase and hired Joseph Ellicott to be the surveyor. Um, however, his methods and his uh, organization were not uh, up to snuff, so he, he was eventually replaced by the man on the right, Paolo Busti, who was a Italian banker who married into one of the banking families of the Holland Land Company and was hired on to be the general agent. Um, so you might recognize these uh, the last names of these two men because you will see their names uh, throughout New York. Uh, if you go Towards Syracuse, you have Casanova, New York. It comes from Mr. Casanova there. Uh, in Buffalo, you have Casanova Creek, also from his name. Uh, in Paulo Busti, you'll actually see his name uh, down in Chautauqua County in Busti, New York. Uh, but he was Italian, so it was Busti, but uh, it's been anglicized. And there's also Busti Ave in Buffalo. So the, the uh, importance of these men is still actually carried on. Now, the job of the general agent was to basically see, oversee the entire operation from the offices in Philadelphia, and it would then be Joseph Ellicott as the resident land agent to operate out of uh, Western New York. So essentially, these two men were Joseph Ellicott's bosses. Now, their bosses were uh, some of the richest men in the Netherlands involved in some of the largest banking uh, industry in the world at the time. Uh, and several of them uh, played important roles actually in Western New York as their names were carried on. Uh, the first I'll mention is Willem Willink. Uh, he was one of the major merchants and he actually was probably the largest involved in the land speculation himself as he purchased uh, his own portion of the Holland Purchase. Uh, he purchased over 100,000 acres uh, 
which was in a narrow strip in the center, and then a large portion of what's in Allegheny County today. Uh, and a town was actually named after him, uh, the town of Willink, uh, which, which was created in the very early portion of the Holland Purchase. And it included uh, the towns today of Concord, Eden, and Aurora or East Aurora. And uh, North Main Street uh, in early Buffalo was actually named after him, was called Willink Ave. Uh, so here is the Holland Purchase itself uh, broken down and how the modern counties uh, shape it out. But uh, at the beginning, it was all Genesee County. And eventually, between 1800 and 1841, it went from one county to eight that we see today. So now that this is all set up, it comes down to one man to make it all happen. And that is Joseph Ellicott. Uh, Joseph Ellicott was born on November 1st, 1760 in Bucks County, PA, uh, but his family moved to Maryland a uh, short time after uh, and to an area now called Ellicott Mills. And his father, uh, I'll mention him briefly, is uh, he's kind of an interesting individual, was actually a clockmaker and watchmaker, uh, very well known. And if you go to the Smithsonian, uh, you'll actually see one of his clocks on display. And his father's name was also Joseph. Uh, so it's the Joseph Ellicott, the elder. Uh, you can see his work still on display. Um, however, uh, our Joseph Ellicott uh, made his name in surveying. So after the Treaty of Big Tree, uh, Ellicott set to work to survey that three and a quarter million acres worth of land. And he did this over the course of three years, which uh, was actually not as fast as he wanted to. Uh, he was hoping to have it done in two, but uh, it was a monumental job, so it's, I'm surprised he even was able to finish it within uh, the three-year time period. Uh, but this was not the first time that he had worked for the Holland Land Company. They had made a purchase earlier of Western Pennsylvania, uh, basically uh, from Erie, modern-day Erie, down uh, quite a ways, and he was the one who surveyed that area. And he was the one who mapped out the western boundaries of New York and Pennsylvania, and actually was the one who set up uh, what become the city of Erie, but it was named Pres Presque Isle at the time. Um, now, uh, El Joseph Ellicott's brothers uh, also assisted him in this project. You had Andrew, his older brother, who actually taught him the art of surveying and was probably the most accomplished surveyor in American history, at least early on, uh, as he he was the surveyor general even of the United States and uh, was the one who actually finished up the layout of Washington, D.C. Now, uh, so the Ellicott brothers were actually uh, did more than just survey what we know as uh, the Holland Land Purchase. They also measured uh, the Niagara River, the length of the Niagara River, the height of Niagara Falls. Uh, the Ellicotts laid out the early village of Buffalo. Joseph ended up founding and laying out early Batavia, and he became the first person to make a 12-inch ruler. So not only is Joseph Ellicott the surveyor of the Holland Purchase, he's also the father of the 12-inch ruler. Uh, up until that time, the measurement of a foot was not a standardized unit of measurement. It was literally whatever foot you had available. Uh, so what he did is he took uh, as many foot long rulers as he could find and lined them up and took the average and it came out to 12 inches. Uh, so that, that's where we get the 12 inch foot from. And he would make uh, many uh, brass rulers in that length and give it to his workers uh, on the uh, survey to use it as a standard unit of measurement. So uh, this work uh, went on for several years. Um, and uh, eventually what we see that map of is Ellicott's work. Um, with the uh, end of the survey in 1800, now is the time to start selling land. And this also fell to Joseph Ellicott. Even though he had no experience selling land previously, they felt that he was the best man for the job because he was the one who knew the land the best because he had traveled just about every acre of that three and a quarter million acres in his time. and seemed pretty adept at uh, working with it. 
So eventually, uh, his first headquarters, you could say, is actually in Buffalo. Uh, that's where he ends up after laying out the village. So his first sales actually occur there uh, in 18... Uh, in 1800, 1801, uh, and then eventually moves on and winters in Clarence today at the Asa Ransom House, uh, as that was the one of the few establishments already in the area, and that was his office for a few months as uh, the winter months went by, and eventually, uh, about 1802, uh, he comes to Batavia and actually founds Batavia and lays it out, at least the early part, of, uh, early portion of it. Now it is called Batavia because that is the portion of the Netherlands that his employers were from. And actually at the time, the Netherlands was called the Republic of Batavia uh, as it was still under French rule. And uh, so that's where the name comes from. And as we go forward in history, there's actually a total of eight Batavias in the United States and they can all be traced back to us here in New York. Um, but a funny little side story that Batavia was not the original choice uh, for uh, Batavia. Uh, Ellicott wanted a name after his boss, Paula Busti. So he thought of Bustyville or Bustyville, uh, depending on how you would say it. Uh, and they agreed that that probably wasn't the best choice for names. And I'm very thankful that we didn't go with that one. Uh, so Boost, uh, Busti said, Ellicott, why don't you name it after yourself? And they almost went with Ellicott's town. And again, that didn't stick, so they went with Batavia. But uh, never fear, Ellicott uh, got many things named after him, including his own town, Ellicottville, down in Cattaraugus County. So it all worked out for him in the end. Uh, so it, eventually, uh, Ellicott, with his settling in Batavia, starts selling the land right away. And the first office that he occupies is actually out of his home which would have been across the street and a little farther east from where the land office sits today. And until 1815, that is where the land was sold. Uh, the building that we're in today was not built until then. It was built to be the first permanent office as they were becoming too busy to operate out of Ellicott's home. Uh, so Ellicott stays with the company until 1821 uh, when he is basically asked to resign his position. Um, he essentially had worn out his usefulness uh, for the land company as they sought him to be the liaison with the political powers that be in New York State. And he did his best in the 1820 gubernatorial election to anger those who would be empowered by not backing Governor DeWitt Clinton. Um, so eventually, Boosty asked... Uh, forced Ellicott out, and this took a heavy toll on Ellicott, as within five years he would actually be dead uh, from committing suicide while being housed in an insane asylum in New York City. Uh, and that's actually where he was buried to start, but the family brought him back to Batavia, and he is now buried in the historic Batavia Cemetery on Harvester Ave. So if you're ever inclined, feel free to go visit his uh, his marker as it's a very uh, exquisite marker and uh, you can see where Joseph Ellicott uh, is uh, today. Uh, so that is the Ellicott Mansion that I'm showing you right there. And uh, that is what it would look like uh, about the 1870s, uh, right? Uh, the building was torn down and dismantled in 1883 so that the city could build some side streets in the area. Um, another one of our great achievements of knocking down our beautiful structures, but uh, it was there eventually. Um, so when Ellicott was selling the land, um, this was quite a process and he attracted many different uh, individuals. Most of them were farmers from New England and Eastern New York looking for better land and better opportunities. And uh, the average lot per, uh, uh, of land that was the normal um, unit that people would buy was 120 acres. And the average price per acre is about $2.50. So a lot would cost you about $300. Uh, this was quite a lot of money at the time. And uh, many people couldn't 
pay that out, right? So Allocate decided to set up several loan pro programs and create very small down payments. It could be as little as 25 cents in some cases and uh, set out to sell off as much of the land for as much of a profit as possible. And this process uh, went on after uh, Joseph Ellicott and the company actually sold out of the uh, land office until the mid 1840s. Um, but in that time, uh, several of the towns were set up. We have early Buffalo here from 1805. And I like showing this map because it shows off the original names of the streets, which are all connected to the Holland Land Company, basically. Uh, if you can see it, uh, you have uh, Busti Terrace and Busti Avenue. You have Schimmelpenick Ave, which um, is one of the members of the Holland Land Company, um, which uh, today is Niagara Street. You have uh, Von Stopforst, another member of the, uh, another banker for the Holland Land Company, and that's South Main Street. Uh, you had Willinks, uh, which was North Main Street. You had um, Sedinsky, who was another uh, member of the land company. And that, uh, so it shows uh, the impact and the sort of reverence that the area had uh, for the Holland Land Company. And actually for a time, Buffalo was called New Amsterdam uh, in honor of the Dutch buyers of the area. And then and here is how Ellicott set up Batavia to start. Uh, so if you're familiar with Batavia, uh, the streets might have different names, but I think you can follow it. Uh, Buffalo Street would be West Main Street and Genesee Street would be East Main Street. Big Tree Road would be Ellicott Street, which is also Route 63. And Elba Street is Oak Street today, which is Route 98. And all the others sort of follow uh, the same patterns that we see today, but uh, obviously it's, it's filled in quite a bit. And here is a, a very early rendering of what the land, land office looked like. Uh, so if you've been by the land office, and it's the stone structure out front. And as it that exists today is basically the how the structure has been since the beginning. Um, now the land company, uh, the, the office, central office for this region was in Batavia. However, as the population grew and counties expanded and broke off into their own entities, uh, several other land offices uh, were created. You had one in Buffalo, in Lockport, in Ellicottville, in Angelica, and also in one in Mayville, which uh, becomes important to the story as we go forward. And uh, it was from this building that um, that well into the 1840s that the land company continued to uh, sell the land of Western New York. Now, uh, Probably one of the few of the seminal moments uh, during that time, the first being the War of 1812, which was fought predominantly in our area, particularly on the, uh, the US-Canada border there. And, and Batavia actually plays its own role and the land office plays its own role in this. Um, after the burning of Buffalo uh, in the very end of December in 1813, many of those refugees actually retreat to Batavia, and so does many of the remaining American forces. And it's actually at Joseph Ellicott's house that becomes the army headquarters uh, for the American forces in the area. Now, uh, Ellicott actually takes a lot of the valuables and moves them across the Genesee River uh, to a more secure location, but stays in Batavia himself. Uh, and actually, Brigadier General um, Winfield Scott actually uh, uh, recuperates in Batavia after the Battle of Lundy's Lane when he's uh, injured. And uh, it was here that basically the Americans were going to make their stand across the Western New York, though thankfully the British never came. Uh, in the area, Elkit, <coughs> excuse me, 
Um, Ellicott had actually built an arsenal at the be, uh, behest of uh, New York State, so there was actually a stash of arms in the area. And it was because of the War of 1812 that Batavia actually gets a larger arsenal right after the war ends in 1816. Uh, the other major moment is the building of the Erie Canal, and the Holland Land Company actually has its fingers in that and uh, assists where it can. They actually donated 100,000 acres to the building of the Erie Canal. Now, the, this 100,000 acres was not along the way where the Erie Canal was built. It was actually down in uh, the southern tier in a rather unsavory part uh, because it wasn't selling very well. So what they did is they basically gave that land to New York State, who could then sell it to raise funds for the Erie Canal. But without that, maybe the Erie Canal does not get done nearly as quickly as it did. Um, now, the land office's uh, importance to the area, and here is a blueprint of just what the um, first floor of the land office looked like. Uh, it was split into four offices, essentially identical, uh, with a staircase in the middle. So if you come into the museum today, you'll notice that one side has actually been changed. Uh, a middle wall has been taken out. Uh, that happened in the 1880s. Uh, when it, this was actually a church for a little while. But other than that, the blueprint is essentially the same. But where the land office really makes its mark uh, on the development of West York is in the building of roads. Before the land company comes here, there are essentially no roads. There are several Native American trails that are really the only main forms of land transportation. Uh, Route 5 today uh, was the major uh, Iroquois trail that went all the way across, across the state and was a main reason why uh, Ellicott chose the, the spot that Batavia is for Batavia uh, as it was along the major trail. It was on the bend in the Tonawanda and it was right at the eastern border of the Holland Purchase. But as you can see, uh, by 1804, there's several other large roads. Uh, Route 5 becomes Buffalo Road and then Genesee Road. You have Oak Orchard Road, which becomes uh, 98. You have Big Tree Road, which becomes 63. You even have the Erie Road, which you can see part of the throughway falls now today. So all these roads were created by the land company in order to essentially allow people to come to the area because it would not be easy for them to come and buy land if they can't get there. So roads were very important uh, aspect of the land company's development. And many of the major roads that we have today follow their, their paths. So uh, it's important to remember that. Now, I mentioned uh, that there was a the land office in Mayville. So this will bring me to sort of the, the end of the Holland Land Company. Um, by the mid 1830s, uh, there was a lot of anger towards the land company um, from several areas. Uh, New York State was sort of sick of them because they weren't getting any taxes off of them. So they actually changed the tax code in order to tax more heavily foreign owned land. And their tenants and uh, the people that bought and uh, lived on the land that they got from them were not happy because the rates seemed to be too high and uh, the collection policy was a little too harsh in their mind. So this all came to a crescendo uh, in the beginning of 1836 and lasted well through until 1837. Uh, so down in Chautauqua County, uh, several hundred farmers got together to protest uh, the land company's policies. And this was not a peaceful protest as they took it one step further and actually attacked the land office in Mayville and uh, essentially burnt it to the ground with all the records uh, within it. All that survived was the stone vault on the property as they couldn't burn that down. And that stone vault is still there today, right in the heart of Mayville, right near the county buildings down there. So you can still see it today. Um, but uh, this um, unrest spread throughout the entire purchase and actually came right to our doorstep here in Batavia. As in 1837, uh, few hundred men actually got together and marched on the land office here in order to take it 
and destroy their debt, essentially. Um, this was, uh, the word of this was received by David Ellicott Evans, Joseph's nephew, who was the resident agent here at the time. And he actually got together about 50 men with muskets to defend the land office. So this almost turned into a battle. Uh, however, when the, by the time the mob arrived, um, local militia had come and the local sheriff was here and eventually convinced them to disperse, though uh, the whole incident lasted uh, through the night and into the next day. Though there were shots fired, no damage was committed, but tensions were at an all-time high. And this sort of signaled the beginning of the end for the land company as their popularity in the area was almost gone and they had basically worn out their welcome. So by uh, 1845, they had sold off all their assets uh, to other companies and everything was sent back to Amsterdam and the Netherlands, um, all the original records. And that led to changes in the land office, the building uh, it operated as a, uh, a land office still until 1860. Then it became a school for girls, Mrs. Bryan's uh, finishing school, and it had one time had 40 students. Uh, they actually lived in the Ellicott Mansion and went to had their classes uh, somewhat in the building. And then it became a free Methodist church uh, from 1880 to 1888. Then for a short time was an apartment building. And then since 1894 has actually been a museum in one way or another. Uh, so it's actually served a uh, historical purpose for a long time. But uh, the story of the land company is much longer than even everything I've told you, but uh, it's integral to the development of Western New York. And you can't talk about Western New York without mentioning the Holland Land Company, which is somewhat odd because even I didn't know anything about the Holland Land Company till I came to the museum. So it's, I think it's, uh, severely overlooked, but it should be uh, taken uh, with, uh, it should be uh, looked at uh, as the most impactful maybe part of our area's history. Uh, so I'm more than happy to take any questions if anybody has one um, and uh, can answer them right here. And uh, I'm, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, it's always, I always love uh, talking about my uh, my research here to other people, and I thank you again for letting me do that. Thanks, Ryan.